my remit is to, to talk to you about um, how imaging and advances in endoscopic imaging have helped guide endoscopic therapy, minimally invasive endoscopic therapy for, for esophageal neoplasia. And the evolution of the fiber optic endoscope has developed rapidly over the past 70 years from the, the first fiber optic gastroscope that was created by a then PhD student, Larry Curtis uh, and uh, Basil Hersewitz back in 1957. Um, and the first charge coupled device in 1968 really led to an explosion in endoscopic advancements, not just in imaging, but also as the imaging got better, we became more adventurous as advanced endoscopists and we went from doing colonic polypectomy in 1969 to ERCP to the first varus hill band ligation in 1990, and this slide goes on and on and on. And in 2015, as you've all seen in the lectures today and what's on the horizon in the next two years, the, 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 there's a limitless um, scope of minimally invasive endoscopic intervention, but it's driven by imaging. So where are we now? You've seen today some of the scopes and some of the new technological advancements on the stands are absolutely mind-blowing, from uh, confocal les laser endomicrocystoscopy uh, to volumetric laser endomicroscopy. The, um, the, 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 the kit, the scopes, the tools we have at our disposal to look and find neoplasia, microcancer, um, uh, are really pushing us to improve our endoscopic skill set. But how can we drive therapy? Well, before we even think about learning about resection or ablation or whatever the next intervention is that'll come up, whether it's cryo, we need to find the pathology. And in order to find the pathology, we need to understand where the abnormalities lie. And the only two places that we can look at through the endoscope are at the microvasculature and then in the mucosa. And we know whether it's in the esophagus in the stomach that disorders in the vasculature from regular through to irregular through dilatation, tortuousness, go through a stage of normal to neoplasia. And the same applies for mucosal architecture, whether that's colonic polyps, gastric pits, esophageal pits, that we go through regular, well-organized mucosa to irregular and then featureless absent mucosa and all of these are indicative of neoplasia. In the esophagus, they are two big pathologies. This is what I spend most of my week doing. And we look at vas vasculature. We look at intrapapillary capillary groups in patients with squamous neoplasia, and this guide us to the stage of neoplasia, but also guide us as to which intervention is most likely to offer these patients a curative intervention. In Barrett's, Professor Kieslik has spent many years describing endoscopic classification systems and diagnosis in Barrett's mucosa from regular to irregular. Very simple. It's very binary, but these all come down to in, in, in investing in imaging and looking at the integrity of the mucosa. In the stomach, the same applies with intestinal metaplasia, but also with abnormalities in microvasculature and also in the mucosa um, leading through to that metaplasia to carcinoma sequence. In the colon, not so much with microvasculature, but we have multiple classification patterns looking at mucosal anomalies. We have the CUDA classification, again, helping us to differentiate between types of neoplastic and hyperplastic polyps. So <clears throat> most of you are here today because at some stages in your life, you will have put your hands on an eye scan uh, capable endoscope, and we know and love these different settings, from surface enhancement to help give you a bit of depth and resolution of the pits, to vascular enhancement to help look at the microvasculature, to contrast enhancement. So I'm going to just focus a little bit. I know you've had a lot of data today, so I'm just going to show you some nice pictures. So this is what an average Englishman looks like. He smokes a bit too much. He drinks a bit too much Guinness. And he doesn't really use that gym membership very much. And so 
we get a lot of acid reflux, and we know in 10% of patients with acid reflux, there will be a change in the normal squamous lining of the distal esophagus to metaplasia. And most patients with Barrett's esophagus, it's of no consequence. They will take it to their graves, and we really don't need to worry, and some would argue that maybe even surveillance is of no great benefit. But in a minority of patients, they progress to neoplasia, and to mucosal neoplasia, and when patients have high-grade dysplasia or intramucosal cancer, the risk of progression to deeper, more invasive disease is very, very high in the region of 50, 60 percent. And these patients do very badly. In the UK, patients with esophageal adenocarcinoma, 85 percent, percent of patients will be dead in five years. So if we can intervene at a precancerous stage, at a neoplastic stage, if we can use imaging, to drive diagnosis, then now we're in a situation where we can do resection, whether it's mucosal or submucosal disse dissection, and ablation, whether it's RF ablation now, cryoablation tomorrow, the technologies will continue to evolve as long as we can find the neoplasia. For those of you who come from a surgical background, this will be very appealing to you. This is not the sort of thing that endoscopists like to see. Patients should not be having esophagectomy, no matter how good you are as uh, surgeons. But this is something we need to move away from because we now have the tips and tricks in our hands to find early neoplasia. And we need to understand why, and the reason being is that patients with mucosal neoplasia, the risk of lymph node dissemination is really very, very low, less than 2 3%. But as soon as there is deeper disease, then, of course, surgery or adjunct therapy with chemoradiotherapy is the intervention of choice. And we know this from large volume surgical and the EMR series, which have shown that the risk of nodal metastases is very low in patients with mucosal neoplasia. So if we can find it, we can now treat it. So this is something called the Seattle Protocol, uh, which is still, by most uh, societies, be they in Europe or America, the gold standard of sampling patients with Barrett's esophagus. And this relies on random four-quadrant sampling of the tubular esophagus uh, every one to two centimeters. And we know that with very, very nice data, uh, that even in expert hands, we only sample 3.5% of an entire segment of Barrett's esophagus. So we will miss neoplasia. So I'm just going to now get you guys to wake up, and I'm going to ask you, this will play for about 30 seconds, just to tell me where is the cancer on this slide. Is it 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock? Just shout out, tell me. Anyone? Who's still awake? Six o'clock, okay. Any I feel like I'm at an auction. Uh, six o'clock, anyone else? Two o'clock, okay. Any advances on two o'clock? Two o'clock, so most of you, two o'clock. Anyone else? So now we're gonna just go through the different eye scan modes. And any, so we've got two o'clock and six o'clock. Any, anyone else? Three o'clock, okay, so we are, uh, we're getting warm. So what we're going to do now is we're going to use some vinegar from the cafeteria. And where's the cancer now? Anyone want to change their mind? Yeah. So actually, you're absolutely right, because this was resected, and the lesion was indeed at 7 o'clock, and this was an M3 intramucosal cancer. And that little lump you saw at the top was just low-grade dysplasia. So if you invest time in your imaging, if you invest time in chroma endoscopy and you give your patient every chance of a high-quality endoscopy and you take your time, then we won't miss the neoplasia. The resection is easy, but actually it took 25 minutes to find that. It took five minutes to do the resection. I'll go to the next slide. So <clears throat> just in the confines of time, I'm going to just show you some data from our own center where we've looked at various classifications. So over the past few years, there have been classification systems which have looked at mucosal and microvascular abnormalities from Kansas, from Amsterdam, from the Nottingham group, which have classified lesions as regular or irregular based on the mucosal and vascular patterns. Um, and even this is in expert hands, we can see actually that the accuracy of neoplasia detection at very best is 75%, and the inter-observer agreement is moderate. So these are high volume sensors in experts who are seeing a lot, a lot of Barrett's. So we did a study um, where we got three experts uh, from my center, from Leuven, from Nottingham, 
And we did exactly the same thing. We used high definition wide light endoscopy. We used eye scan. We recorded lots and lots of normal and not normal Barrett's esophagus. And what we wanted to do was to see whether with eye scan, without magnification endoscopy, whether we could improve the detection of neoplasia, um, but also come up with a uh, classification system for the detection of Barrett's. And so we collected 60 patients, some with, some without acetic acid. Uh, and there was an equal mix of non-dysplastic and neoplastic Barrett's esophagus. And we looked at the accuracy, but also we looked at the kappa values to see whether we all agreed with each other or whether actually we were just talking rubbish. And so these were our data. So we looked at patients before and after acetic acid. And actually, if you look at the middle column, <coughs> our sensitivity and specificity was just slightly lower than the previous data. But as soon as we used acetic acid with eye scan, not only did our accuracy improve, but actually we all tended to agree with each other. And so when we compare this to the previous um, classification systems, you know, London, we may not be good at many things, including football, uh, but what we are on par with is detecting neoplasia with acetic acid and using eye scan. So this is a, a new piece of kit that we've had, and this is a, a high definition magnaview scope where you have 136 times zoom. Um, so if I can just ask you to play the video. So this is the patient again with intestinal metaplasia. Uh, and if I can get you to play that video again, please. And this on the bottom is same patient, uh, contralateral wall is high grade dysplasia. You can see here, just by investing a little bit of time, you can see the very nice regular architecture here. And in the bottom, I don't know if you can make that out, completely distorted, irregular vascular. That's high grade dysplasia. Go to the next slide, please. So just to finish off, very briefly, I'm going to talk to you about squamous dysplasia. This is not something we see much in the Western world, and this is a much more aggressive disease. And it is um, difficult because it hasn't got a macroscopic apparent precursor like Barrett, where you can see the... Uh, columnar mucosa to, to drive your eyes and to drive sampling. These are very subtle changes in the microvasculature. But we know that this disease behaves very, very differently. So even when you have low-grade dis dysplasia or moderate dysplasia, the risk of progression to invasive squamous cancer is a lot higher. And the risk of nodal metastasis, even when you have deep mucosal um, squamous neoplasia, is much, much higher than Barrett's cancer. So this is a very different disease. And therefore, we need to be very, very accurate with our staging before we offer these patients therapy. And so we have to choose our resection, whether it's mucosal resection or submucosal dissection, based on imaging. And we know that because the lymph node dissemination between mucosal disease and submucosal disease is so different. And so um, this is the intrapapillary capillary loops, which most of my endoscopy colleagues in the UK will never have heard of. And when we put this slide up, they look at you as if you've just made this up. But this is a true phenomenon. This is the branching submucosal vessels, and they go through a vascular to an avascular stage through the neoplastic to cancer sequence. And subtle abnormalities in these IPCLs can help you to differentiate between what is mucosal, so amenable to mucosal resection, and what is slightly deeper, and what needs submucosal dissection, but also what needs to go to surgery. So just to finish off and summarize in the last couple of slides, where are we going next? So <coughs> the guys that Hoya and HQ are current, constantly pushing us, and this is a really exciting new uh, technology that uh, I've been very fortunate to use over the past uh, few weeks, and this is uh, eye scan optical imaging, uh, OE. Um, and there are two modes, OE1 and OE2. Mode 1 uh, uses a combination of uh, post-processing images, but also some optical filters. Um, and then there's mode 2. Um, which is designed to improve contrast of white light observation, and it brings the overall color tone closer than that of, uh, of natural color. So just uh, to, to finish off, so this is a patient who was referred up for um, endoscopic resection of uh, incidental finding of squamous dysplasia on a gastroscopy report that was normal. And when we put the endoscope down, as you can see, 
It was not normal. And so this is the new iScan OE1, which we are looking at and exploring uh, to see how we can use it as an adjunct to the already established uh, endoscopic enhancements with iScan. Um, and this is iScan OE2. And one of the benefits of having the MagniView series is we can really look in real close detail at the microvasculature here. And you will see here with the MagniView scope really quite beautiful pictures of the intrapapillary capillary loops, um, which help not just at lesion characterization, but also at lesion demarcation to help guide our therapeutic intervention. We've been doing a lot of work over the past couple of years, and I know a lot of you in the audience have been instrumental in populating this website. So um, if you forget everything else that I've talked about in the last 14 and a half minutes, if you can remember this, this is a fantastic forum for Pentax users. It's iscanimaging.com. Um, a huge amount of work has gone on behind the scenes from the team uh, in Hamburg, uh, and they should all be very proud. And this is a, a developing platform uh, for learning outside of the endoscopy suite and provides a unique uh, tool from uh, lectures to product information, but more recently quizzes uh, and informative lectures. And I would recommend uh, that yourselves or your fellows, if you have um, some spare time to log on and have a look at this. Um, so to summarize, you can see just through the few slides that I've shown you that endoscopic imaging is advancing very, very rapidly. Um, and we are becoming more adventurous with our uh, minimally invasive endoscopic therapy really to pick up with uh, this early detection. But we need to give every single patient the highest chance of exhibiting their neoplasia by giving them the highest quality endoscopy uh, with the best quality image enhancement. So use your best endoscope and take your time and make a diagnosis before you biopsy. Thank you very much.